Welcome to the StoryCraft Cafe. Come in, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and get ready to join the storytelling conversation. StoryCraft Cafe is brought to you by Dabble, the ultimate cloud-based fiction writing software. Here we're going to bring together storytellers from all walks to encourage and empower you to craft your best story. If you're writing your novel in November, you can get an extended trial to use Dabble to write your novel. If you're not already a Dabble user, go to dabblewriter.com, sign up for your free trial, go to NaNoWriMo, register your November project, and you can use Dabble for the entire month of November. It's amazing. You're going to love it. Be sure to join us over on our YouTube channel where we're doing some really fun videos right now. We've got a series going of AI tools for writers and how they might can help you. We're also doing a series of videos coming up very soon on the different styles or methods of plotting. That's going to be a lot of fun. So we'll put links in the show notes where you can go over and subscribe for free to our Dabble YouTube channel. Now on to our show. And we are live in the StoryCraft Cafe. Jessa Maxwell, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm excited to have you. And on such an auspicious today, uh, yes. auspicious day. Today is release day for your brand new novel, The Golden Spoon. What a fun novel. I love this book so much. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. I love it. And we're going <laughs> to we're going to talk all about it in just a little bit. But, um, you know, I have a couple of fun questions to kind of kick off the conversation. Yeah. Uh, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I don't know if it was like I actually knew I wanted to be a writer, but I vividly remember being in preschool and on a swing set and saying she was on the swing set. Like I narrated <laughs> in my mind the different things that I was doing. And um, yeah, I'm sure just emulating storybooks. But I think that's definitely the first. That's a good question because I hadn't thought about that in a long time. But yeah. So you had a third person narrator just oh, on yeah. your shoulder at all times. Yeah. Like I mean, it's very dramatic too. <laughs> that is so fun. That is so fun. Uh, well, The Golden Spoon is your debut novel. Is that right? It is. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote um, and illustrated um, children's picture books before this. Okay. But it is my first novel out in the world. So very exciting. Very terrifying. So being um, at the point in your journey where you are now, um, you had to have received some writing advice along the way. Um, and some of it may have been just gems that you've held on to. You're like, thank God I got this advice from this person. It has made the process so much more enjoyable or easier or whatever. Or maybe it was such a horrible piece of advice that it's just funny where you are at this point. Do you have a piece of advice that sticks out to you that was yeah. either wonderful I mean, or terrible? I actually don't think I've gotten a ton of writing advice, okay. but I do remember talking to someone um, years ago and he said, you just have to finish a book because most people don't finish their books. Yeah. And that really stuck with me. And I think he's very right. You know, I think a lot of people don't finish their books. Everyone thinks that they have a book in them. And that's, you know, maybe 70% of the battle <laughs> getting there. Yeah. You, you know, um, I, I've said before that, you know, if you're at a, a dinner party or something and you're talking to people, I think the vast majority of people would say that they have a book in them or a story in them. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that's a, that is a, a human quality mm -hmm. that, that we all think we have a story yeah. to tell. Well, and, and we they, probably do. We I probably mean, do. You're right. Uh, you know, for, I mean, all throughout human history, our, our history was an oral history. We were mm -hmm. storytellers. That's just Absolutely. part of who we are. Yeah. But there's something that separates the people who, who say I have a story and the people that tell a story. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think that that hurdle is that that keeps because, you know, if the vast majority of people say that they have a story, but on the other hand, the vast majority of people don't tell that story. Mm -hmm. What do you think the, the hurdle is? I mean, I think I am actually quite a poor storyteller in person. Like I'm not I don't 
maintain people's attention the way I, I'm always envious of people who can tell a story at a table, right. and see people. I think I veer off. And so I don't know. I mean, I think it's just pushing through and it's a lot of problem solving to write something down. And it it's very frustrating at times. And I think probably some people would rather not <laughs> do that because it's kind yeah. of torture occasionally. So I don't know, but I also think, I think for me, I like, you know, visualizing things and I like living in my imagination and some people probably are more prone to that than others. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think I knew about you that you, um, have written children's books. Mm -hmm. What what got you started uh, down that path? I started out kind of as an illustrator actually. Um, yeah, I, when I went, I guess, I guess I lived in the Netherlands for a little bit. I was a journalist actually first. Okay. And then I started going back to drawing, which was kind of my first love because I um, went to school for art. And once I started doing that, I got kind of interested in illustrating. I've actually made like cartoons for the New Yorker before too. Wow. Um, Started getting into comics and things like that. So I was really into doing, you know, the drawing. Um, I still love it. I still love doing both, but they're very different. Like, parts of your brain. And I, I do prefer writing. I think (laughs) usually it depends on the day. (laughs) Well, journalism is another thing I didn't know about you. Um, but I know a lot of novelists that were journalists at one time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I I find that's an interesting skill set that you acquire as a journalist. Um, do you, do you recognize any tools that you picked up from that time in your life that now serve you as a novelist? I mean, I think I always have really enjoyed talking to different kinds of people and that's definitely helped me. I think for a lot of writers, I would bet that they go into journalism because they want to be writers. And that's one of the things you can make money at as a writer or or told that's a, you know, an acceptable way to be a writer. So I would think that would be, I mean, that was definitely why I, did it. And I think it took me a while to get confident enough to, I mean, it definitely took me a while to get confident enough to write a book, like a full novel. So it was good practice. Well, you know, there, and there may be subtle differences in different types of journalism. There's probably mm-hmm. vast differences. Um, but if you think of it kind of at it, at its base, um, you know, reporting on a story, especially if you're in a big city like New York or Chicago or Los Angeles or whatever, where a happening uh, may occur and a dozen people show up to cover it. And it's interesting because even though you'll read each one of those dozen accounts, Mm -hmm. they all have the same facts, but there are little nuances that, that come from because people notice different things. Of course. Um, Do you feel like that, that some of those things have helped you as a novelist, like the, the thinking of a situation, but looking for the, particular pieces to pick out that are going to make it resonate with readers? Maybe. I think I've always liked that stuff. You know, I think I've always enjoyed, I think I've mostly picked up on other, like when you read other writers and how they are able to do that. And that's just very, I've always been really fascinated by, you know, that I've definitely, I'm working on my second book now. And so I'm, I'm finding myself more paralyzed by like choice yeah. than I was in my first one. For some reason, I know there's like a second book curse and you've talked to lots of authors. So you probably could tell me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's uh, it, it, um, it, if you talk to, to musicians, there's, there's something about the first album that yes. they make yes. where they have just kind of worked on that album for years and years mm. and workshop these songs. And all that. And then the second album is usually when when they've made a little money and everyone's buying houses and drapes. And, yeah. and you know, the, the second album is like the, the drapes, you know, buying album in it, mm-hmm. you know, and the third is usually where you you get, you know, your feet back under you for for whatever reason. But yeah. I'm not sure that that's uh, an an equal comparison with with writing, but it's, you know, it's fun to talk about. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So from from illustrating and writing children's books and Mm -hmm. illustrating, you know, for The New Yorker and and different things like that, um, what brought you over to to mysteries or or cozy mysteries? I mean, 
Well, first of all, I wouldn't exactly classify. Everyone classifies it as a cozy mystery. I don't think yeah. it's quite a cozy mystery. I like to think of it as like a cozy thriller. So it's okay. slightly, but it's okay. I'll take what I'll take what people decide to call it. But um, Co- cozy mystery is a huge umbrella, and it is. It, it is. encompasses so much, yeah. and yeah. maybe that's not a fair umbrella. No, I think. I, I, I mean, I, I no, I I think it's it's definitely not. You know, like a hard thriller. I think. Yeah. You know, it's whatever the maid was, you know, or is. It's the same right. subgenre of one of those kind of like both of them funneled into one place, I guess. Um, but now I forgot the question. <laughs> I was say, what, what brought you from what brought you into oh, yeah. wanting I, to write in this genre? And uh, like, wh- were you a fan of mysteries? I was. Yeah, I've always I was always, um, you know, like to read mysteries. I've always loved really commercial fiction. Actually, I've enjoyed that kind of plotting and find it really interesting. And I've always liked multi-perspective kind of Agatha Christie style yeah. um, mysteries. And so I just felt like I could write one, you know, I really felt like I could do it. And I, I took me a long time to decide what topic I wanted to write on. If I wanted it to be, I had a bunch of different ideas kind of swirling around, but I wanted the first one to have a little bit of like oomph to it, you know, and have an interesting plot. So I was walking around and I was like talking to my mom on the phone and I was listing off my ideas and I was like, this is the time to do it, you know, now. Um, and I just thought, what about the baking show? Like, what about the Bake Off, basically? You know, what yeah. if something happened at the Bake Off? And at first I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. That I don't know if people would like that. But then I kept thinking about it and I thought it seemed like it could be the best option for me. And I liked it. I liked thinking about it. I liked exploring it in my mind. So I decided to go for it. And so, I wrote um, it actually really quickly. I, and I loved you, writing that book. So um, define quickly. You've three months i finished it three months i added more too so wow. about four months total but yeah it wow. was it was a really fast i wrote it over the course of a summer that's amazing what was this like pandemic time it was kind of late pandemic it was okay. i was the summer of what are we in now 23 21 okay so it was kind of yeah it was pandemic yeah, it was weird, the world was still weird and yeah, and I think that was probably conducive to writing a novel. Honestly, I wonder if lots of people wrote novels during. I actually, my husband is a editor, and I know that lots of people wrote novels during that time. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and I've been, um, I've been interested to see what books are coming out pat post pandemic mm-hmm. because you know and there have been a, a few stories that have been told that are pandemic based or mm-hmm. some you know kind of global happening mm-hmm. nobody wants to read that i mean i agree no, yeah. that, i don't want to revisit that no, no with no. the exception of katherine ryan howard who i think it did a good job yeah um, that was a fun book to read but um yeah no i agree i i don't want to read anything about that but i'm sure <laughs> like maybe the next generation will be interested in what happened then you know right, right. probably it's- people who went through wars didn't want to read about those right away either right we know World War II fiction has had a an an epic yeah uh, decade so or half yeah. decade or whatever it is. Maybe it needs to be you know eighty years in the future or something when right. when, when it can really... be romanticized a little bit. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, uh, all the you know stuff will be swept under you know, and they'll find something fascinating to talk about. Yeah. Um, you when you said that you were looking for a way to frame the story and you came up with the, with the, mm-hmm. the baking competition. Um, w- when you f- start thinking about a new novel, are those like, are you looking for a plot device to exploit or are you thinking about a, a character and then figuring out where to plug mm-hmm. them? Like w- what comes first? I really wanted something where I could have the cast be diverse because I wanted multiple perspectives. So I didn't want something where it was just like, you know, five 25 year old women in a a certain place. I wanted to be able to have men, women, all different kinds of people, different ages. I think that's really nice to have different voices um, so that their voices would be really distinct partly and just partly because it's more interesting, I think. So 
Um, yeah. So as I look for new books to write, I'm always kind of looking for that. Um, but I don't know that I'll always, you know, use that many perspectives. There's so many perspectives in this book. When, um, wh- where did the characters come from? Like you, you've got, um, the, the grandmother character, mm-hmm. um, like, were you looking for something for readers to kind of, um, resonate with someone that they would feel comfortable with? Like, how did you start casting the story? You know, I'm sorry. I'm in New York. You can tell. With that sound. Um, yeah, I, I think I just want it to resonate. I, I, to me, I always kind of, I hope anyway, I always write, I always write a little bit for myself. Like I want it to like all of them in their own way. Like I wanted to find characters. I started writing a couple of different characters and they disappeared and then ended up with the characters I have now. And I didn't know when I started who would stay and what would happen. Um, but I loved developing those characters like differently. And I do think, you know, it's important that each character can help move the plot forward. So each of them have different strengths are able to, just like we were talking about, able to see different things um, and be able to like bring their own unique spin to whatever is happening so that they can help kind of move the plot along and solve or contribute to the crimes at hand. Um, I am, um, I'm in the middle of writing uh, a mystery trilogy. And for me, the, the mystery never comes in the beginning. It it always begins with characters and then figuring out what these characters find themselves, yeah. you know, in does the, how, where in the, in the planning of the process does the mystery that needs to solve, when does that come to play? I don't know exactly. I mean, I started this one with a murder so that you knew, and right. then you, you know, kind of work back from there. I've definitely read, you know, unflattering Goodreads reviews that my mystery comes too late in uh in the book. So, you know, for some people it's too late. I like to think that, you know, you seed these things so that people can kind of get invested because I don't know how a mystery would start unless it turns into a police procedural. I don't know how it would start at the beginning of a book, really, if it's right. a murder mystery. Um yeah, it's kind of tricky. It's like, you know, and to get rid of the you know, to, to kill someone, you have to like, it's like, you have to contend with like the police and stuff. So that's always, that's yeah. always a little tricky. <laughs> well, you know, there's a, um, there's the who done it. Um, and then there's also the why done it where mm-hmm. you, you start with a mystery like that and then you have to figure out why did this happen? Mm-hmm. But you're right. You, you have to really dance around, especially in, in a, a modern setting with mm-hmm. all of the modern technology mm-hmm. and things like that. You know, we don't have to wait three days for a constable to to show up. Yeah, you know, exactly. I know it really, it really does a number on some of us trying to write this <laughs> stuff. I did enjoy this one because I got to get rid of the phones at the beginning, which really helped. I think um, I saw an interview with Alexander McCall Smith when I was at BoucherCon, and he was like, "If I don't like it, I just get rid of it. I just don't even bring it up. There's just no phones." <laughs> <laughs> You, you know, whatever works. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. It's your own reality. So as long as you're fully invested in it, I think it works okay. Right. Um, mystery is so fun to me because, um, you know, if we if you really think about the the modern era of mystery, we we think of Agatha Christie mm-hmm. and you know a hundred years ago, and and they are you know those books are constantly in print. We're we're making new movie representations Mm -hmm. of these old stories and they still work you know they're Mm -hmm. still absolutely i remember when when they remade uh murder on the orient express um Mm -hmm. i I took my kids to see it and and everyone loved it you know Mm -hmm. and it it resonates just the same today as it did then um what do you think it is about mystery stories that are just so everlasting i don't know i think we all want to be escape into things. I think they really draw you in and you want to, and we deal with, you know, unreliable people in our lives all the time. And this is just like taking it a little bit further. Yeah. And it's just a fun thing to immerse yourself in. I think, I mean, it's like, 
Yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't even know why we're so into mysteries. It's, it's the same reason people listen to murder podcasts, probably. Right. right. Yeah. The <laughs> true crime is having a moment yeah. right now. That's yeah. for sure. That's for sure. Um, when you, when you said that you were looking for a, you know, a, a framing element and you, and you kind of landed on the, the baking uh, show, um, that, that is something that is, it, it's so interesting to me that, and, it, and this is where cozy mystery kind of is that huge yeah. umbrella that we talked about. Um, and, and we recognize yours is more of a cozy thriller than mystery. I get it. Um, but the, um, th- there's something about bringing in all of these different elements and you can set a mystery anywhere, mm-hmm. um, you know, but anywhere that, that people congregate, there mm-hmm. could be a mystery. Mm-hmm. Um, what was it that, what was so fun about this particular setting that you came up with? Well, it's such a, you know, kind of pure place to have a murder. So having it on the set of a baking competition, I think is really interesting. And then, you know, you have all these different people, you have the filming aspect, which is very interesting because people, you know, sometimes act on camera a certain way differently than they Mm. would act off camera. So there's a lot of different elements to it um, that were really fun to consider. And I just had the best time writing it. Did, um, did the, the baking show, did it provide um, certain elements that helped the telling of the, you know, like that everything's being filmed. Did, did that offer something to the story from your perspective or were there certain things about that setting that kind of amped up the the storytelling or the mystery element. Yeah. I mean, I think when you have people in competition with each other, you know, off the bat, that's really yeah. helpful. Um, you know, that gave already everyone had a little bit of a motive to do something. And then I, uh, yeah, you've got the people filming you. There's, there's pressure, there's, you know, temperatures and, and ingredients and i just i always imagined what it would be like to be on one of those shows and it sounds absolutely terrifying to me i'd be so bad at it i'd be like running around (laughs) totally freaking out so i always kind of admire people who are able to keep their cool in those circumstances but i also think like what kind of person can keep their cool under so much pressure you know right right yeah um, what, to, what are the elements, um, that separate a mystery from a thriller? Like, like, where do you draw that line? If a, if a story is venturing more into thriller territory than mystery for, for people that don't read widely in the genres, w- where would you say the difference in those types of books are? I don't even know, really. I mean, I think I would compare m- my book to like the kind of amount of thrills you see and like, you know, like the guest list by Lucy Foley and right. that is categorized as a thriller, but you know, this is a very similar setup that someone dies at the beginning. Like, um, you know, there's not a lot of violence in it. So I, I don't even know what the categorization is. I think I just balk a little bit at cozy mystery because you see these books that have like kittens on the cover. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Right. But it's not, you know, it's not so cozy that it's like there's no substance or like that. It's not that it's I guess that's what I, I what I worry about with a cozy title. But I can't find it. People are going to call it cozy. So. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and, and if there's no if there's not blood splattering, you know, on the page, you mm-hmm. know, a lot of people kind of consider that the mm-hmm. uh, the violence happens off screen yeah i Um, yeah i guess i mean i've read a lot of books though that that they're categorized as thrillers and don't have a ton of violence i'm not sure honestly what the distinction is and maybe i don't read you know enough really hardcore thrillers or like or i you know i don't really quite understand the distinction with horror either honestly right um well speaking of that um how how do you ratchet up the tension without bringing gore uh, into it. And, and maybe that's kind of where one of the lines for horror and thriller is, is yeah, maybe not a gore. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm like you that all those lines are, are really Very funny, blurry. especially yeah. on the edges. Like, um, but h- how do you maintain this sense of tension um, while not 
grossing people out? I mean, I think a lot of it is people's internal lives and using that and imagining what they would be experiencing and thinking. You You can make things pretty creepy. Just, you know, I always find that the scariest movies that I've watched are ones where just they can make like just a doorknob turning and be really creepy. And that to me is a lot. If you have a good enough character development, I think you can make, you know, you can make anything kind of scary because people are invested in these characters. And then if you're watching them and something happens, it's startling and and jarring. And I think the setting helps too to make a setting that is kind of conducive to a creepy environment. Yeah. And it's helpful. Yeah. Um, you said that you wrote this book in three months. Uh, basically, did you have a plan going into it? Because you, you kind of alluded that in the beginning, you you weren't exactly sure where things were going to go. So how much of the story did you know before you start drafting the book? None, really. I did. I mean, as I worked on it, I started kind of. I have like a very I'm I write pretty messy. Like I don't go from the beginning to the end. I write in different pieces and kind of fill in the blanks as I go. Um, but then I started having a plan where I would write down, you know, as I got in, invested in the characters and I knew what was happening, I would write down, you know, what happened, what day and what, you know, what each character was doing. And that was helpful. But for the most part, I kind of wrote those things as I w- went along. And there were, you know, times where I would get to like, you know, 30,000 words and then cut, 15 of them and then go back and build it back up again. I have a friend who is a hardcore planner, like, mm-hmm. you know, outlines everything. And and I was having a debate with him one day because I'm not necessarily that, mm-hmm. um, you know, that structured in my writing. Yeah. We'll just, we'll just use those flowery words. <laughs> um, but he said, he said, well, the, the truth is that everyone is an outliner. It's just, are you going to outline before you write or are you going to take all of the pieces that you have written and then figure out how to organize them and, you know, and, and put it in order. So yeah. do you think in those terms, like no. when you, said you kind of, you know, writing various pieces, was there a point where you had like these jigsaw puzzle pieces and, and you a kind of started bit. putting them together? I think there are, I think I go off in the wrong direction sometimes. And then I have to go back and kind of reassess But it's also just part of exploring and figuring out what you want the book to be. And I don't think I could plan well and write as well necessarily. I'm not sure, but I have a feeling it would be not as good if I planned it completely, just because some of those connections are like really fun to make and like really fun to, you know, discover. And maybe it would be fun to, you know, be able to plot it all out at first and know what you're doing too. That might be (laughs) exciting, but I really, I've really enjoyed different times where I'm like, Oh, and then this could happen. It's so incredible, you know, and, and that I wouldn't know those things until I got deep enough in and kind of discovered who the characters are, because I don't know how you can plot what your character is. You can plot a book, but like, can you figure out who the people are ahead of time so deeply? I, I would have trouble with that. I think. Yeah. You uh, you said that you're working on your second book now. Is is your writing process for the second book any different from your first one? Or were there things that you picked up along the way with the first one that you're like, oh, I'm going to do this next time? I wish I the second one. I definitely is similar writing process. It's just taking me longer um, this time, but I'm it's it's coming along. It's um it's you know it's in the like end stages now. And it has been really fun more recently to write than it was at the beginning. But it took me a while to like, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't quite have the right characters at the beginning, I think. And I had to re-evaluate. Gotcha. Well, the new book that just dropped today, The Golden Spoon. I love this book, Jessa. I know everyone else does too. We're going to put links in the show notes where you can grab it in hardcover or in Kindle edition or audiobook. I have not yet gotten to listen to the audiobook i read the the arc on my kindle um have you listened to any of the audio yet i have not listened to the audio i picked i helped I pick so out some fun. of the um 
the uh, characters though um, I was able to like you know hear them ahead of time reading other things but the woman who voices Betsy her name is Jackie she is absolutely incredible and has we've been in touch and she's just so lovely I'm so excited that she's doing that um, I think it's going to be a really good audiobook it's like a full cast so very oh, fun it's going to be so much yeah. fun well I'm I'm going to run over to uh, Audible and grab it today and, and listen um, this week um, Jessa, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you're up to, is there a place online where they can find you and connect? I think Instagram is the best. It's Jessa Maxwell author. And I usually post all of my events and things there. So excellent. We'll link that up as well. Uh, the golden spoon, go grab it today. Jessa, thank you so thank much. Thank you. For thank you for all of your show. wonderful questions. That's our episode for today. There's so much more to come as we talk to authors about the craft of writing, but also the business of publishing. Be sure to subscribe to the StoryCraft Cafe podcast in your favorite podcast app so that you never miss an episode. The StoryCraft Cafe is made possible by Dabble. Writing a book is challenging. Your writing tool should not be. Dabble is an easy-to-use online writing tool packed with helpful features that allow beginning novelists and published authors to create amazing stories. Visit us at DabbleWriter.com and start your free trial today. Thanks for listening.